Good morning. Good morning and welcome to everyone here today. Welcome to the second annual Water Lily Women's Luncheon to benefit the services of Stillwater Hospice. Thank you to each and every one of you for joining us on this very special day to reflect on, remember, recognize, and celebrate each one of us for the roles that we have served, are serving, and will continue to serve as caregivers. I have been involved with Stillwater Hospice since 2016. I have served on their board of directors. I'm Melissa Long, by the way. Uh, <laughs> development committee, uh, assisted with events, and have been a longtime ambassador for this wonderful organization and its amazing work. I understand the importance of caregiving. And I am no longer the primary caregiver for my 94-year-old mother who still lives at home. But I understand that even when you have others helping you, and two willing, wonderful siblings who help you, it takes a village to take care of an aging parent or loved one. And many of you have experienced this firsthand. Many of you uh, are only children, have no siblings, or have siblings that live far away, or have siblings who simply aren't interested in helping take care of a parent. And so it falls on you, and that is a very difficult task and I applaud every one of you that is doing that for a parent or a loved one because it is very uh, difficult work, but also very rewarding. I invite you to continue to enjoy your salads and one another's company. The main course will be served in just a few minutes. And now I would like to invite Suzanne Motes, chair of the Stillwater Foundation Board, to please join me on stage to present the invocation for today's meal. Suzanne. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of Stillwater Hospice, I welcome you to our second annual Water Lily Luncheon. We thank you for joining us this morning in support of a community organization which started in Fort Wayne over 100 years ago and continues as a vibrant force in much of Northeast Indiana. We come this morning from different faiths, different communities, and different walks of life. And we come together today in support of clients and their families who are making a journey that we too will one day take. Our task is to help provide sustenance and support for this organization, which makes Northeast Indiana a truly wonderful place to live. When I think of the many ways of coming together to support one another, I am reminded of a book I often read to my children, Stone Soup. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. I learned it was based on a centuries-old European folktale. The story tells of animals in the field and forest who have been impoverished by an early winter, winter and wonder how they will survive. They find sustenance in making stone soup when one animal puts a rock into a pot of water and invites the others to add to the soup anything they might have. They come one by one, bringing a carrot here, some limp lettuce there, a small potato, some wrinkled fruit. In quick order, they came together bringing what little they had created and making a wonderful nourishing soup. It was really the new friends, the new strength, and the joy of service to one another that sustained them. Like the place of rest and recovery evoked by our Stillwater water lily emblem at the center of each of your tables, we invite you to contribute in whatever way you can to spread the good news of the stone soup spirit of service, sustenance, and support found in our Stillwater community. The only community-based, not-for-profit hospice in Northeast Indiana. 
With your support, Stillwater will be a strong and vibrant source for good in our communities. Consider the many blessings we have been given this day. Close friendships, an inspiring program, and the rewarding opportunity to serve our communities in enduring and truly meaningful ways. While we are a group of diverse faith traditions, we recognize a need to thank the power in our life greater than our own. Please bow your heads for a moment of silent prayer as each of us expresses gratitude and thanksgiving in her own tradition. Now, as we enjoy food and friendship, let us all consider all of the ways we are able to add to the stone soup that is Stillwater Hospice. Bon appetit.
Hello, I'm Leslie Friedel and I'm the CEO at Stillwater Hospice. I'm so honored to be standing in front of all of you today at our second annual Water Lily Women's Luncheon. Thank you all for coming and sharing this time together. As women, we are called to be caretakers during many times of our lives. I stand before you with a deep appreciation for the incredible strength and resilience that each one of you embodies as caregivers. Today I want to address the challenges you may be facing, offer some insights, and support and remind you that you are not alone on this journey. Stillwater Hospice is here to support you and your loved one who are facing serious illness in the end of life. Whether you're caring for children, aging parents, or someone facing terminal illness, your compassion and dedication make a significant impact. The care you provide is the backbone of our community, and it deserves the recognition and appreciation. As caregivers, we often find ourselves stretched thin, juggling various responsibilities, and wearing multiple hats. It's crucial to remember that self-care is not selfish. It's a necessity. Taking care of yourself enables you to better care for others. So today, I encourage you to embrace self-compassion and make your well-being a priority. As we navigate the world of caregiving, we must not forget the emotional aspect of the journey. It's okay to experience a range of emotions, from joy to fulfillment, to frustration and exhaustion. Embrace these feelings and remember that self-compassion includes acknowledging and validating your emotions. Communication is key. Reach out to your support network, whether it's friends, family, or local community resources. Share your thoughts and feelings, and don't hesitate to ask for help when needed. Remembering, remember, seeking support is a sign of strength, not weakness. At Stillwater Hospice, we want you to know us before you need us. Our services help provide a solid base of education, compassion, and guidance as you navigate through the challenges of serious illness and caregiving. The, de the best way to explain what hospice care looks like is to hear about it from one of our own, our RN case manager, Amanda Fanger. My name is Amanda Fanger. I'm a registered nurse, case manager for Stillwater Hospice. My typical day is gonna start at home, even the night before. I'm gonna look ahead to see who I have to visit that day, plan out my visits. I look at patients and know a lot of times in advance what they're likely to need. I provide support to my patients by sitting down with them when I come in for a visit and just talking with them for a few minutes to see how they're doing, how they're feeling, what sorts of issues they might be dealing with at that time, and then just going from there and providing whatever support they might need, whether it's with symptoms, pain, or if it's emotional, then we can just sit and talk about that too. In hospice, it's a kind of a common misconception maybe that it's just a sad job. And while there are sad parts to it, it's not entirely sad. I really enjoy those patients that I get to keep for a length of time. Not everyone that gets on hospice is going to pass away in a, in a week. So there's patients I've had for a year or more and I really get to know them and we can talk and we get to know each other and we joke and we actually have some really good times. And yes, that does make it harder to lose them sometimes when that time does come, but there's a lot of joy in just getting to know them. Hospice is a really unique kind of nursing. There's much more one-on-one, -on -one, really dedicated time you get to spend with each patient. You're gonna have some stressful days, but for the most part, you don't have that intense stress that you might have in other areas of nursing. When I'm with my patient, I am just with that patient. I'm able to focus my whole attention just on them, meet their needs, and I really enjoy being able to give that undivided attention to each patient. My absolute favorite part about working for hospice is the relationships that I get to develop with my patients. I think most nurses would say that they went into nursing because they care for people and want to provide comfort and care. And I think 
in this role, I get to do that more than in any other nursing role that I've had. And I feel like I'm making a difference in that patient's life and in their family's lives. Thank you, Amanda. I hope you do know us before you need us. Know that we provide informational visits to families at no cost so that you have the information and education on what is available when you are ready to take that next step, step and admit to hospice care. Know us before an unexpected loss occurs so that you are aware of grief services that are available to you, your family, and your friends. Know that we've never met a family that said, I wish I would have waited to admit to hospice services. The sooner you are aware of what hospice service can provide, the sooner you and your family can be supported. Know that we love providing tours to groups or presenting in the community about what Stillwater Hospice does to support our patients and their families. We also provide an extensive array of offerings through our Peggy F. Murphy Community Grief Center that Alyssa Ivinson will talk about with you a little bit later in our program. At Stillwater Hospice, we understand the needs of women. 91% of our staff are women. We care for more female patients than we do men on hospice services. In looking at our 140 volunteers, 83% of them are women. We are led by an all-women executive team. We understand the importance of work-life balance, and that's why, as an area employer, we've implemented policies such as extended parental leave, civic duty allowances, and time off to vote. Additionally, we've established an educational fund to ensure that our employees have access to ongoing learning opportunities, empowering them to grow both personally and professionally. I now want to provide a huge thank you to our corporate and individual sponsors that made today possible. Each of these sponsorship levels has a tie to nursing, the establishment of Hospice Internationally, or Stillwater Hospice History. Please join me in recognizing our sponsors who helped make today possible. Our Nightingale sponsors, named after Florence Nightingale, who is known for her role in modern nursing. Three Rivers, Fort Wayne Medical Oncology and Hematology, LC Nature Park, and Jerry and Becky Henry. Our Schatzter sponsors, named after Josephine Schatzter, our very first nurse. Advocare Systems, Ambassador Enterprises, American Senior Communities, Burn Ready Mix, Corsica Technologies, Donovan CPAs, Dio McComb and Sons Funeral Home. Home Care Home Base, Porter Family Foundation, Steel Dynamics, Sim Financial Advisors, and Taft. Devlin Sponsors, named after Isabel Devlin, the organization's first director, hired in 1923. You can see we are beyond excited to have 32 individuals and corporations who have joined us at this giving level. Let's all give them a round of applause. Thank you for your generosity and support of Stillwater Hospice's services and programs. I also want to thank our board of directors, Stillwater Foundation Board, our stewardship committee, volunteers, and staff for making this possible. We all play, will play the vital role of caregiver at some point in our lives. In fact, most of us serve in this role as I stand here today. My hope is that when you leave here, you can be a resource or hope for someone facing the hardest role we all play, a caregiver. I want to express my deepest admiration for each of you. Life as caregivers is not easy, but it is profoundly meaningful. Thank you for coming today, and I would now like to introduce Kathy Rogers, who will share her Stillwater story. Well, good, good morning and good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to tell our story. I try to get through this without crying, but first of all, I'd like to um, welcome my guests today. Um, I have my ladies here that work with me who are my work family, KB Search Team, and they were part of the caregiving process when we were going through um, the end life with our parents, and especially Susie who helps so much with our caregivers and the scheduling and so forth. Appreciate that. I have my bonus daughter, Sarah Sourtag, who always encouraged me and gave me big hugs. And my husband, I think who's the only man in the room. So, um, 
who was most supportive and was there for me when I came home in the evenings, and I appreciate that. But most importantly, my sister, Kim Didion, is here, and I honestly don't know what I would have done without having you in this process. So anyway, we'll get started. I have print this big, so hopefully I won't have to use these. So we'll start there. Um, just a little bit about the beginning of our family. So my mom and dad um, met in Sunday school um, when they were in high school and were married in 1959, Bruce and Sue, married at 20 and 22. Nine months and five days later, I came along. Um, we loved to tease my mom about that through the years. And then my sister, 15 months later, Kim, and then my brother, three years later, Bruce. Um, we had a really pretty special growing up time. Um, grew up in Fort Wayne. That same year my parents got married, they bought a lake shack with 900 square feet on amazing property. So over the years, my mom was a stay-at-home mom um, in the beginning of when we were growing up. And so in the summertime, we three got to live at the lake with our mom. And it was such a special time. My mom was such a loving person and caring person. She loved animals. She should have been a vet. We grew up with every animal. Um, any stray animal came to our home. We raised raccoons, um, you name it, guinea pigs, dogs, cats, bunnies, birds. It was all there. So um, the family cottage was an amazing place um, we had for 45 years. And um, we just had an amazing childhood there. In addition to that, we had a family business. And so my dad's dad um, got involved in the um, employment agency business in the 50s. And then um, my dad joined him. And then my brother and sister and I joined him. And so we all worked there for many, many years. So imagine this. We're all adults. We work together. We go to the lake every weekend with our families, with all of our kids. and. Um, Family was really important, and did we get along all the time? Heck no. Did we have our fights and challenges? Yes, but there was a theme with our family that we just loved each other and we worked through it. Um, so life was going on pretty wonderfully, and um, in about 2004, my mom started experiencing some minor car accidents. Um, in her speech, she would freeze, um, so it took us some time to figure out what was going on. And in 2004, she was diagnosed with Parkinson's and Lewy bodies. And um, it was a challenging time, because her symptoms weren't significant, but um, so as we were doing research, trying to figure out what that all meant, um, you know, Parkinson's effects, movement, balance, speaking, thinking, you know, thinking. With Lewy bodies, there's hallucinations. My mom saw things. In the beginning, it was kind of comical because we'd be driving with her and she'd be like, do you see those cats right there? And we're like, no. But it was a very slow progression. Um, Parkinson's is usually a progression of, you know, five to eight years. My mom almost lived up to 20 years. So we were lucky to have her for that long. But as my mom's Parkinson's um, started to continue to um, grow and um, she got more and more challenging, my mom couldn't drive anymore. We all three were working as well as my dad. So we were trying to figure out how do we keep my mom's life. She loved to play bridge and played in bridge groups and wanted to be active. So um, her friend had just passed and she had a caregiver named Bonnie that we knew as a family. And so she joined our family as our first caregiver. And Bonnie drove my mom to bridge, took her to appointments, to the grocery store, all those things so, so she could have the in independence. Um, my mom was, at, and we all were in college, my mom went back to school too and became an RN. She was just a nurturing and caring person. And so um, just a little bit about her, she just was just so loving and kind. Um, and as my mom's disease progressed, our need for caregivers progressed as well too. So I'm going to step back out of that just for a moment. So in 2009, I had the opportunity to start my own company, KB Search Team, and um, with all these one amazing women. And they're all here except for Rhonda, who is caregiving for her husband right now. So um, we understand that. Um, but in 2017, Pat McCombs in our organization got a call from one of the board members at Stillwater asking if we might be interested in coming out and chatting with them about a CEO search for the organization. So I went along with Pat, and at that time we had the opportunity to meet with many of the board members who were serving on the search committee and had the opportunity to put a proposal together, and we were given that search. So we're happy to say that Leslie was a result of our search, and so that's how I first learned about Stillwater in 2017. That was a God wink, honestly, because that prepared us for what we needed as we went on the journey with both my mom and dad. 
But we were so impressed with Stillwater, their compassion, their facility, the people. I mean, their, their mission, what they do, it was just so wonderful. And we would meet at the Peggy Murray Community Grief Center, which was newer at that time, um, just a beautiful facility for our meetings. And so um, just it's a wonderful, wonderful thing for our community and for those who are grieving. So back to mom, as she was progressing, um, we were needing 24-7 care. So when we looked at the roles in our family, one of the things when my mom got sick, we had a family meeting. We're like, okay, mom and dad, there was always their wish. They wanted to be able to stay home. And so um, um, that was our goal, to keep them home and to keep them safe. And so um, moving along through that process, we started as a recruiter, I hired caregivers for my parents. And it was not easy at all, but we found folks. We had a lead caregiver um, who was just amazing, and she managed all of our caregivers and their schedules and kept track of the care needs every day. But as mom was um, growing more and more severe with her Parkinson's, um, transferring her, getting to doctor's appointments, getting her in and out of bed, I mean, she needed full 24-7 care. Um, we had another family meeting, like, how are we going to keep mom at home? This is so important. And so um, I remember Stillwater. So we asked them to come out, and they met with the four of us, my, mom, my sister and brother and dad and I, and um, went over their program with us and what they could offer. And um, we said yes. And so within days, they came out and did a full assessment on our mom and her current care that we had with our caregivers. Um, they provided so many needed resources, um, a hospital bed, which was so helpful because getting my mom in and out of bed and raising that bed and sitting her up was just a, just a tremendous thing. They evaluated her meds. They um, gave us the advanced medical care we needed to keep my mom at home. So we had you know, nurses coming out on a regular basis. We had doctors when we needed prescriptions for infections that she was getting. It was just a tremendous relief to our family. The other thing that they provided for our caregivers that were there 24 seven was additional help and advice and monitoring. It just, it just gave us such a peace of mind. Um, one of the programs that my mom loved the most, they have a music therapy program, and I wish I knew this woman's name, but she came out with a guitar, and she would sing, my mom loved Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Johnny Cash, and Dolly Parton, and oh, Don Denver, and she would sing all those different kinds of songs. And my mom didn't, wasn't speaking a lot at that time, but she sang, and it was just so joyful to see her and what she did. Um, but the communication that Stillwater provided to our family during this journey with my mom was just incredible. Mom's last days at home, my sister, I just tell a few of the roles in our family. So my sister was really our lead caregiver. She was the biggest advocate for our mom with our caregivers. And matter of fact, she took off, um, took a leave of absence from work the last five, six weeks, and she was there with my mom and the caregivers providing everything that she needed in just being with our mom. Um, my brother's role, he had moved in, he was helping my dad. You know, when you have people coming 24 seven into your home, it's a, it's a whole different thing. And my dad, love him, he was an A personality, he was very um, perfectionistic, he likes his house a certain way, and you know, we got people coming and going, so it took, it was a village to take care of him. So my brother did that, um, and then I was, finding the caregivers and kind of managing the caregiving process. And so that was kind of all of our roles. And then together, all three of us tried to manage my dad, which was a little challenging, but we did it. Um, but the last few days that my mom was living, the thing is they made my mom so comfortable. She was never in any pain. And they came out and sat down with us, the nurse did, and said, it's not going to be long. And so prepared us what to look for. And so my sister and I were just hanging out with my mom the last couple days, 24-7. And um, I have to share with you, this is just the most beautiful thing. So um, it was very close to the end. And my sister's like, Mom, we kept telling her, it's OK to go. We're going to be OK. You know, we love you, and it's going to be OK. And she just was laying there, you know, and just hanging on. And so my sister put on a, a song and started singing a song that was called, When I Get Where I'm Going. 
I don't know if you've ever heard that Brad Paisley and Dolly Parton song, and my sister started singing it, and it was just so beautiful. And right after that was over, my mom passed. And so we were, we were so grateful that we were able to have the wishes of my parents to keep her at home. And then, of course, we make the call to Stillwater. They come out. They help us prepare my mom. They call the funeral home. They, they come and, you know, um, take my mother away. And then this, it doesn't stop there. They provide the grieving. They were calling us. They were providing all kinds of services to our family. We were just so grateful. So moving on, we did not know at that time that we'd be needing to use still water so soon after that. So my dad, he's been 85, very vibrant, riding his bike five days, I mean five miles a day, going to the Y, going to the car wash, and getting his hot chocolate every day at Debran. Those are most important. Um, was very lost. My parents were married for 61 years. Um, but we kept him busy. He loved the lake. Um, at that time, they didn't have their cottage anymore. So um, he was invited to a lot of friends' cottages. We brought him up to our lake homes. Um, Friends kept him busy with dinner, and we were thrilled to hear that he was going to go to Florida um, for the winter to be with his friends. My dad had a collection of wooden boats and showed them all over the country, and he loved that world and loved those people. And there's a city in Florida, Mount Dora, where all the wooden boat people would res reside in the, in the winter, and they invited him, and we're like, yes. But in the last couple years that my mom was sick, my dad was starting to have some memory issues and some dementia. Not bad enough to stop him from driving, but we were taking over some services for him. So after my mom passed, we did keep on our lead caregiver for um, part-time, which he did not want, let me tell you. That was a true challenge. Um, but um, So she would go back and forth to Florida. We would visit my dad. He was thrilled. He was on the water every day. He was with a lot of, quite honestly, widowers down there and just enjoying life so much. So he came back in May. and. Um, the force was back, and we were prepared for him, and he did an executive physical every three to five years, and he had one set up. So he went in May, had an executive physical, and they found a large mass under the right side of his arm. And um, being the man that he was, he's like, I'm done. I'm not going to, I'm leaving. And they're like, well, we have to biopsy this. Nope. I have done so much in my life. I know where I'm going. God's in control. That was his big line. God is in control. And um, so he came home. I had meetings with the doctors, and they said, you know, it's up to him what he wants to do. They suggested it might be lymphoma. We weren't ever sure. Um, so that was May. Um, by beginning of June, my dad was not eating. He was um, in one week from riding his bike to driving to a walker to a wheelchair. It was so dramatic and so fast. And here's a man who's a force who never sat down, who was 24 seven doing, 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 doing. So we're in like pretty shocking times because we thought he was gonna live to be like 120 and drive us crazy at least that long. <laughs> um, so again, his wishes were to stay home. So we start calling in some of our caregivers that we use with our mom. But he was progressing very rapidly. And so, again, we call Stillwater. And they came in immediately. And really with him, we needed that bed so drastically. Um, he, he was suffering with um, breathing and some different things. And they provided resources for us that were just tremendous and support for us because we were totally in shock. And we had called um, Stillwater, I think it was on a Friday, right, Kim? And he passed away four days later, at home, and that was his wishes. And again, we went through, you know, the whole um, process of they came out, they helped us prepare our dad, the nursing, or the funeral home came out and took my dad. And I have to say, my dad's services, Emily from Stillwater, came out and delivered a beautiful American flag blanket to our family, which was so touching because my dad was in the Army and it was so appreciated. But again, the care, the ongoing support for the three of us that were left. I mean, to lose both parents in 15 months, it was unbelievable. And nothing, nothing we, we knew my mom was eventually gonna go there, but we didn't think our dad would. And so I would just say to you, like, we were not alone in our journey and never could we have fulfilled our parents' wishes to, 
have them stay at home if it weren't for Stillwater. And we will be forever, ever, ever grateful for the services that they provide to our family. I mean, I just can't say enough about the care and the quality of the caregivers and the folks. Their compassion is, is just amazing. So we again, thank you so much, Stillwater, for all that you did for our family. And we're so grateful. Appreciate it. Oops. told me to come up. I was so busy thinking to myself after hearing Kathy's story, wow, that is exactly our experience with Stillwater Hospice, and I just, I'm losing my, my mind here, but I do, I don't want you to just come up here, <laughs> because you deserve <laughs> a fantastic introduction. And I am so pleased to introduce a woman who co-chaired the campaign to make the Peggy F. Murphy Community Grief Center possible, uh, Stillwater Hospice board member, and she really truly is a community treasure. And that's what I wanted to say. I didn't want you just coming up here, uh, Nancy, because you deserve an introduction. And so Nancy Stewart is here to announce the winner of our Water Lily Award. So please welcome Nancy Stewart. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And I would just like to say welcome ladies who are certainly in the company of a fine gentleman. <laughs> I am so pleased to have the honor of presenting this year's Water Lily Award. This award recognizes an individual, foundation, or corporation who has made a significant contribution to Stillwater Hospice with their time, talents, and or treasures. This award recipient will have shown a dedication to supporting women in their various seasons of caregiving, as well as being an ambassador for Stillwater Hospice's palliative hospice and grief support services. Before I announce this year's recipient, I want to tell you a little bit about her. She has, she has served Stillwater Hospice since before the establishment of the hospice home in 2001. As you walk through our campus, you'll see her name included on every plaque that recognizes a fundraising committee who coordinated fundraising funds for Hospice Home, the addition onto Hospice Home, and the creation of the Peggy F. Murphy Community Grief Center. When you hear her speak of Stillwater Services, you can feel the passion she has for sharing our message and telling the Stillwater story. She knows the experience of caregiving through the loss of her parents and her late husband. She loved caregiving for her young daughters and seeing them blossom into women with accolades and impressive careers of their own. When she speaks about her daughters, you'll hear the love in her voice through a bit of a southern drawl as a huge smile stretches across her face. Her love of music has provided something to Stillwater patients, families, staff, and volunteers that goes beyond words. During the pandemic, she knew of a dear friend who was being cared for at Hospice Home. At that time, we limited the amount of people who could be in a patient's room at one time. 
knowing that his time on earth was limited, she reached out with calls to coordinate a mu musician from the Fort Wayne Philharmonic to come and play outside the friend's window. I'm not sure who was impacted more, her friend, his daughters, or the cellist who provided such a moving performance. This one performance has now extended into weekly performances at Hospice Home for our patients and their families. To date, cellists and violinists have performed over 130 times at Hospice Home. She makes this possible. This year's recipient has given back in many ways to so many organizations, from Headwaters Park, the Girl Scouts, YWCA, Fort Wayne Parks Foundation, Fort Wayne Philharmonic, and many, many more. We are grateful for her leadership, guidance, and service as a member of the Stillwater Foundation Board of Directors. Please join me in recognizing this year's award recipient, Eleanor Marie. Needless to say, she's a very dear friend, and I try so hard to get through that. <laughs> About 30 years ago, my father had hospice care at home in Tennessee. It was new in Knoxville. There was no hospice home, and... Kathy knows this, he wasn't going anyway. <laughs> he, he was going to stay home. And we all went home to help care for him. And the hospice came in, and uh, I said, I'll do anything I can for hospice in the future. And it's all been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'd now like to introduce to you Alicia Ivinson to share information with you about the, really the best kept secret in Fort Wayne, the Peggy Murphy Community Grief Center. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, I practiced and didn't cry, but we'll see how this goes. March 12th, 2015, I became a member of a club I didn't want to join. My mommy died. I was 30 years old. She was 63. My mother, Karen Ivinson, was diagnosed with some kind of uterine or endometrial cancer in 2007. With surgery and radiation, she beat it. Cancer cleared. But her radiation treatment had caused internal damage that we didn't know about, and that ultimately led to her unexpected and sudden death eight years later. I was stunned. I was numb. I was lucky to have a strong support system, but I didn't know how to navigate life without mom. The next year, in 2016, a guy I had a crush on sent me some information for a Memories of Mom retreat at the Community Grief Center. He works in home health care, so he was on the mailing list from Stillwater, so he knew about it. That guy, by the way, is now my husband of five years. <laughs> <laughs> I had always been apprehensive about therapy. I'm a fix-it-myself kind of person, but this was a group setting, and I liked that. Safety in numbers, right? So I went. Well, it was amazing. It's pretty neat, actually, to be in a room full of women who have all lost their mothers. Being with others who had the same kind of loss was more comforting than I expected. 
In that retreat, we talked about writing letters to our person, not just a journal, but letters addressed to them. And that really resonated with me. There was something intimate about it, like I was getting to talk to mom again. I write the letters in this, and here's the little paper that I always have when I'm writing to her. I was in Thailand on March 12th, 2018. That was my mom's three-year angelversary. So I brought my notebook of letters and mom's picture that I always put out when I write to her. And it was pretty powerful to bring her with me around the world. It's an experience that's thanks to the Community Grief Center. Mom also always doodled a little five-petal flower everywhere, so I decided to get a tattoo of it. And the artist asked me what music I wanted to play, and I said, well, oldies, because that's what we always listen to. So he just puts on random YouTube, and the first song that plays is My Girl, followed by Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> so I'm bawling, trying to hold still <laughs> for the tattoo artist. But now, anytime we see five petal flowers or something with five petal flowers on it, it reminds me of mom. I also tried to keep mom close by wearing her clothes and jewelry, especially her wrap skirts. So preparing for today, I found a StoryCorps interview that mom and I did in 2010, and actually I listened to it for the first time since she's died. I was 25 at the time, and we were talking about me missing my childhood and my fears of the unknown future. But now her words strike me as also true in the grief journey. So here's some advice from my mom. I think almost everyone on earth still feels like a child in some way at some time. And even a 70-year-old woman can crave her mother and her father and just want that security. And that's just part of life. And it's all a stage, and you have to walk through it. I would say find the joy in it. And so for each stage you go through, feel it and experience it and acknowledge it, but don't let it, don't let it paralyze you. Don't let fear paralyze you because things will be good and things you know, will never be perfect. There's pain in life and nobody escapes it. And yet there's joy. And if you have no pain, you have no joy. Find the joy. So August 2018, I married that guy, uh, and I incorporated my mom how I could. I turned her wedding dress into my rehearsal dress, and I used some of that fabric to make a handkerchief, and I carried it in one of her purses on that day. Uh, in 2020, we got pregnant, and no, it was not a stay-at-home pandemic baby. <laughs> we had been trying for two years. But again, I tried to incorporate mom how I could. I wore her dresses for maternity f shoots, and we did not find out if we were having a boy or a girl. So I had outfits for the hospital for both. Of course, the one for a girl had five petal flowers on the print. Our due date was March 8th. Well, the 8th came and went, then the 9th, then the 10th. My water broke on the 11th, and I just knew the one thing that I didn't want to happen was about to happen. March 12th, 2021, Mom's Day also became my daughter's birthday. Chloe Kiva came four days late and arrived on the one day I didn't want her to. I wanted a day just for mom and I wanted a day just for Chloe. But God, mom, and Chloe had another idea. And her middle name, Kiva, was my husband's idea. K-I-V-A for my mom's initials, Karen Ivenson. So even though I recreated pictures I had of me and my mom with me and Chloe to still try to feel like she was there, to say my grief was back was an understatement. It was like ground zero, and postpartum hormones did not help, but I was a mess. I was a new mommy, and all I wanted was my mommy. Chloe is now three, and she is so smart and so silly, and Grandma Karen would love her so much. And we talk about Grandma Karen, but it's just not the same. So cue the Grief Center. Another Memories of Mom last year was once again so helpful. To be surrounded with people who get it and don't judge you for full-on ugly cry, which you're welcome that I avoided that today. <laughs> this time the focus was music therapy. So we all brainstormed words and phrases that reminded us of our mom and then put them all together to come up with a song. Take a listen. Haven't heard my mother's voice in a while, but her words are always falling out of my mouth. 
Make it happen, get her done, smell the flowers, have fun, be kind and thoughtful. Know when to do and when to be still. Know when to give to others and to yourself. Put people first, laugh and lead by That's what happens when you ask a news person to talk. I say, well, I'm going to edit a video. <laughs> <laughs> so last year, I was just one of hundreds of people to benefit from the Peggy F. Murphy Community Grief Center. In addition to the many group retreats focusing on specific kinds of loss, last year there were more than 2,000 individual counseling sessions. Grief is a journey that's different for everyone, but the Community Grief Center can help everyone navigate that journey. And it is all free to the participants, thanks to the generosity of people like you. So thank you. It takes more than $550,000 every year to provide grief services to the community. And you make that happen. You are making a difference in people's lives. The tools I learned at the Grief Center help me every day, and now I pass those lessons on to those when they're going through a loss. But you can also help by telling everyone you know, whether they've had a loss or not, about how amazing the Grief Center is. Because if not now, they'll need it someday. So thank you for letting me share my mom with you. Thank you for listening to my story. And again, thank you for helping us heal our hearts. Thank you so much, Alyssa. That was an amazing story that you shared about your mom, and I know so many of us can relate to that. Thank you. I hope that throughout today's program, you were able to learn more about the services of Stillwater Hospice and how it can be a resource for you today and in the future. As we near the end of our program, I hope you will take time to look at the pledge card that is in your, your hospice luncheon program. Uh, it's just if you open up the program, there's an uh, envelope in there. There are options to give through check or online by texting Lily to 50155. And here's what your money will buy. $25 provides a hospitality basket for families at hospice home. $50 will provide an American flag blanket to our veteran hospice patients, and we heard a little about that from Kathy, the meaning of that. $150 provides for an individual counseling session through the Peggy F. Murphy uh, Community Grief Center. And I hope that you will join me in making a gift today to support Stillwater Hospice and their services. You can see on the screen behind me that the frontline caregivers of Stillwater Hospice offer their support and thank you so much for yours. We pour ourselves into so many other people and activities that at the end of the day, our cup is often empty. I hope that you can take time to remember that to be able to care for someone else, you also must care for yourself. As you leave our event today, I encourage you to hand any donations that you'd like to make today to our Stillwater staff, which 
will be positioned in the back of the room today. Thank you for choosing to give back to Stillwater Hospice and for being part of the puzzle that makes Stillwater Hospice's services possible to so many people in our community. In addition, please stop by some of our information tables that are out in the lobby here to learn about our services and meet some of our staff members and learn about how you could volunteer with Stillwater Hospice. There are so many opportunities to volunteer uh, just even a little bit of your time and it is so appreciated by the people receiving those services and those volunteer efforts. I know so often people hear the word hospice and they think oh my gosh it means we've given up and I just want to tell you <laughs> my dad was given two to six months to live. We didn't know what to do. I was pregnant. My brothers had families. We called Stillwater Hospice. They came out my dad went into remission and lived for three years. <laughs> and they came out, they still came. All the time, the hospice people from Stillwater came out. For three years, they helped take care of my mom and my dad and all of us. And it is amazing. Don't wait until you need them. Find out about them now and learn about their services, which I hope you have uh, through today's program. And as we leave our luncheon today, we do have a special treat. We've heard about uh, the musicians uh, that have come and become a part of the programs that Stillwater Hospice offers. They play weekly at Hospice Home, and it is such a joy for residents and for the patients there. I can't tell you, music is truly an international language, and it awakens something inside even comatose patients. Uh, when they hear a familiar song. And it's such a wonderful program that was started. Thank you, I can't thank you enough for that. Today, some of those musicians have agreed to attend our luncheon and play some joyful music for us as we leave. So please take it away, ladies. And all of you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much for being part of this wonderful organization today. Thank you.
see how to get it on? Huh? I don't know. I'm just that mine is finally on. Yeah, oh, okay. There we go. All right. <laughs> Especially when they're talking. Okay.